I have with me uh, Willie Robson for, um, from the Chain Beach uh, Honey Farm in Berwick on Tweed. Um, he is uh, a commercial beekeeper uh, in a very, very harsh environment um, and uh, uh, from uh, sort of several generations uh, too. To survive in the c conditions that Willie uh, is in, uh, you really have to know what you're doing. And um, uh, to be able to do it for so long is a credit really to uh, both uh, Willie and his uh, uh, family. So, uh, Willie, um, I mentioned earlier that um, you're a commercial beekeeper. Um, when I was fairly young, um, there weren't such things as bee farms. Everybody considered themselves as commercial beekeepers. Do you consider yourself a commercial beekeeper or a bee farmer, or don't you see any distinction? <coughs> oh, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a commercial beekeeper, yeah. Uh, because for 50 years, that's the only income that the family's had. And uh, prior to that, uh, my father had a little honey farm, and I joined that honey farm and expanded it. So we're actually commercial beekeeper. And the black bees that we keep are the only source of income. So uh, what do you actually run for? Is it completely um, honey or it, have you got other, well, other things well, as well? Well, originally, um, from the, we, we, the borders were almost entirely covered in clover, fields of clover, white clover. Northumberland was cattle country and the fattened cattle and they had, of course, a rotation which involved wheat and barley and, and but for every, every five years there was a field of clover and some farms had clover all the time. They, never, they just did stock clearing and that sort of thing. And that's what Northumberland beekeeping was based upon and that would be the case in Devon and Norfolk and really the whole of Britain at one time. It would be dependent on wild clover, wild white clover, which provided nitrogen for the crops and then the crops <coughs> provided, uh, cattle provided uh, manure for the crops so farming didn't uh, need any chemical. Uh, it was entirely organic in the 50s and uh, we, 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 we kept bees for clover honey and mostly we kept them for producing comb honey which had a decent value and uh, to, uh, sections up to 1964 and thereafter we went on to cut comb and we've actually produced cut comb ever since because it gave us a, a decent income in which to expand the honey farm and pay uh, wages and run a proper business where there was a secretary and, and somebody to do every job, make hives and everything. And it was the comb honey that actually uh, made that possible, particularly heather comb honey. Uh, so we're, we're uh, very much apart from normal bee farmers or, or commercial beekeepers and we, we're probably the only people in the country that produce very large quantities of comb honey. And we're pushing on with that. We've had a tremendous crop of comb honey this year, luckily, because we've had some poor years. And, you know, if you don't get the sun, you can't get comb honey because the bees have to uh, make beeswax and that takes honey to start with and they have to be in a pretty good mood to build a, a shallow super of, of cut comb and they have to be going well. And this, this will be lucky this year because we started very badly. The spring was right, well, the spring we never saw it at all. Uh, if you'd been in the toilet, you wouldn't have seen it. So, <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the middle of June we didn't get going, which we thought was very difficult. And, we're at the stage, you know, because of the losses we've had through other problems, queenlessness and that, we're having to make a lot of nuclei, hundreds and hundreds of nuclei. And of course, you can't make hundreds of nuclei if the north wind's blowing. You can't even touch the bees, never mind make nuclei. So we started off in a pretty miserable fashion. But luckily, as time's gone on, the weather's improved and the heather got enough water, uh, moisture and uh, it was, we've been lucky, we've been lucky this year because it, it, even though we made a lot of nukes late, late on, right into June, into July, <coughs> they mostly all got mated because the weather was good and July is a time when there's a lot of uh, drones about uh, and we've had problems with drones and uh, some of those drones would be fertile, you know, they weren't relying on early drones that might have been affected by whatever 
problems the bees have got, the viruses that uh, so we won't. We can never get we can never get um, queens mated in in May unless we're lucky, you know. So, so can I go go back to comb honey because um, you're obviously doing uh, well out of it. Yeah. Further south, um, beekeepers are moving away from it simply because the general public aren't really aware of, uh -huh. of, uh, 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 of what it is. Yeah. So have you sort of built up a, yes. a, a, a local sort of clientele? Well, we're, 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 the business relies greatly on loyalty, customer loyalty. And so they know that the comb honey will be ready, you know. <laughs> and then as a, a result of the COVID carry on, uh, we got onto the internet to make up some of our sales. Which the business suffered badly during COVID with a colossal drop in sales. And uh, we, got, but uh, we got onto the internet in a bigger way, and and then of course there's a lot of people on the internet who want comb honey, so the people that aren't producing comb honey in the south, the orders are coming to us, you know, and we're very careful about how how we present it. It's a, we make a very good presentation, you know. I think some of the comb honey's been poorly presented that I've seen, and it's very expensive as well. We make we try to make honey affordable. We've got to because we're, we've got wages to meet every month and, and the money has to come in. So the public has to see that what we're doing is acceptable and we're not overcharging. And then we don't, uh, we don't try to, to, to pull it wool over people's eyes. So we get loyalty, long-term loyalty. And the businesses, uh, well, businesses suffered badly in the past with supermarkets. Uh, and we've got the better of the supermarkets, I might say. Uh, that they'll never bother us again because we've just got so much loyalty from customers close at hand within 40, 50 miles, sometimes 200 miles, and another lot of customers on the internet. And a lot of them need the want comb honey. You know. So one of the problems with um, comb honey is uh, wax moth. How do, you, yeah. uh, how do you avoid that? Well, it's just started with us and we've got going and it's... Uh, we are a bit alarmed about it. The people that work for me are, are, are alarmed about it. Well, it's, uh, it's surely not possible to freeze um, uh, freeze a, a huge amount, is it? Well, we'll get, we're actually in the process of buying a 20-foot container. And uh, uh, I have a friend that, that's going to help and, and have it so that it'll run down to 20, minus 20 for a week. And uh, we're actually going to treble insulate other rooms. We've got two rooms in mind that we're going to go to town on insulating and then install uh, freezers so we can drop the temperature down to minus 20. So that's one of this winter's works. If we don't get it all done this winter, we might get two done, you know, because we just develop the business as and when we can and as the money becomes available. Uh, but the, certainly there's a freezer unit ordered and coming. So that's 20, a 20 foot freezer unit. So by this time next year, we'll be fully equipped to tackle cut comb. Mm -hmm. Ta tackle wax moth. Right. It's so, the, problem, the problem is it's the greater wax moth. Yeah, We've yeah. never had any bother with the, with the other wax moth because the bees are able to clear out the hives quite easily. But the greater wax moth, the, the bees have struggled with it, you know. So do you have oil seed rape in your area? Well, we've had, we've, we're actually when the clover failed, or the, the because the clover failed because of two reasons, because the farmers started to pre uh, treat the grassland with nitrogen and they also sprayed the grassland for thistles which killed the clover. So that was our income and this was about 1965 maybe. Our income sort of dived a bit, you know. And then we were lucky because in 1971 the farmers started to plant oilseed rape and uh, then we got the bees onto that and it produced a lot of honey, uh, pretty poor quality honey, I may say. And uh, we, we, we worked away with that with some considerable difficulty because we have hives spread over, I think, 1,500 square miles. And of course, the, 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 the honey was crystallizing within the colonies, within the hives. So actually, we just left the rape honey on and let the bees live on it. We never starved the bees, just let them on it. And in the winter, we cut the comb honey, up, the rape honey up, and crushed it. And eventually, we've got systems going where we can actually uh, produce a marketable jar of rape honey without heating it. We don't have to heat it. And the pre previously, when we were working, we were spoiling the honey by heating it. 
and that had to stop. And we've got machines now that are able to sort the, the crushed honey out and, and, and provide, provide us with honey that we can bottle. Uh, which has, has taken a lot of messing about and one thing or another. We crushed the crystals with a homogenizer, an old, old homogenizer, and uh, get, get it out without heating it because we were spoiling it by heating it. And uh, now, of course, this is increased levels of loyalty because the people like, they like the rape honey uh, that comes from a homogenizer. They like it very much to spread on the bread and it hasn't lost all its flavor. When we first got rape honey, it stunk, it stunk of cabbages, so it didn't have a lot of uh, flavour. But it saved our business, so it, it made a big contribution to our business that we could continue to expand our business and employ more people because there were such vast quantities of rape honey. And most of that rape honey was, was obtained in June. And of course, nowadays, there's, there's a lot of rape around us, rape, rape honey produced, rape planted around us. But most of the fields don't yield honey, or they don't yield any quantity of honey. So, so there's, there's two issues I see there. Yeah. One is um, uh, you presume you can't sell granulated um, uh, comb honey, and the other one is yes. your technique for um, uh, crushing it. Um, can you give us a little bit of an idea about that? Because presumably yeah. you've got to strain the wax out. That's right. Well, well, well. What we did was we left the rape honey on the on the uh, on the hives and t took some off maybe or whatever. But gradually, as the season went on, we were using starter strips in the frames. We weren't using waxed, drawn frames. So because once the rape honey gets into them, you've had it, you're in real big trouble, especially in a wired frame that's been previously been drawn because the honey granulates within seven days. So we were using all starter strips which inch and a quarter at the top bar, on the long the top bar, welded in with a bit of wax and one thing or another and frames. I made all the frames myself and thousands and thousands of manly frames for that purpose. And as the season went on, we went from comb honey, from rape honey to comb honey in the frames because they started to get other honey round about. So when we cut the, the honey out, we could always get a bit of comb honey round the corner, here and there, and one thing and another. If there was rape in the middle, it didn't matter, you know. So that's how we kept on with our comb honey production, even though the rape honey was rock solid, you know. Into July, we started to get another honey, and it was all in the same frames as the rape honey, but I could sort it out by eye, you know, because you get some honeys that are obviously not going to granulate, whereas the rape honey is white, and you can see so the idea was eventually that uh, we were cutting out all this rape honey and I got a potato masher from a local factory and smashed it into a, into a pulp. So then we were, we were, we were putting in, in hot cupboards and one thing or another and heating it and that was spoiling the honey. So eventually I got, I got a machine. Well, I was in, I was in uh, Sweden or Norway, uh, Jönköping giving a lecture and saying that uh, the troubles we were having with the rock solid rape honey, well, they were the same. The beekeepers in that lecture, uh, for all, we were speaking two different languages. They, they understood and they had had a lot of trouble as well. So a lad in the audience said, well, I can build a, a, a rotary uh, separator, which is a quite unique design. And uh, he says that'll take the, 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 the the wax out of the crystals. So uh, when we, we use that machine, we can put it through at about blood heat, the honey, and uh, the wax is in, in a certain place and uh, the crystals are in another place because the, the specific gravity of the wax is 0.8 and the specific gravity of the crystals is 1.4 and that machine is able to separate, separate them out. So he says, well, if you give me £1,500, I'll, I'll make it. And that's been used ever since. And it's a unique machine. Uh, and so then, once, we, once we've let it settle a bit, uh, the honey and the crystals, we'll just push it through a homogenizer. Well, we did have roller mills. I got roller mills that had been in a chocolate factory. And I really went to town on them, made them up stainless and one thing or another. But the problem with the roller mills to take the crystals out, that it was pulling in air, and there was so much air getting pulled into the honey 
but it was, you could never jar it because it was, it was all, the jars were always full of air. Uh, so I knew eventually, we sort of thought the way through it, that we would have to take the crystals out uh, in a machine where there was no air could get in. And that was a homogenizer, which was used for mixing uh, milk and cream to make uh, ice cream. And uh, of course, the, the, the homogenizer can't have air in it because it, it cavitates, the machine cavitates. If it sucks air, it goes bang, you know. Don't wanna... So now we can, we can force the crystals through a, a tiny or orifice against a spring pressure of 3,000 pounds a square inch and come out with honey that we can bottle. So that was, that was really, you know, a, a lot of work and a lot of consideration. And all the machines we were using were out of scrap, except the one we got in Norway. But the Norway man saved my bacon. And he wasn't even an engineer. He was, he was, he was a bus driver or something. But they'd had the same trouble. They'd had the same trouble in Norway, because there's a lot of rape grown in Norway, you know, Sweden as well. I went on a lecture tour over there, all round about. So um, your comb honey, um, we're not asking you, where, or I'm not asking you where, to, where you sell it to, but are they um, uh, end users, you know, sort of um, uh, shops, or, or do you sell wholesale? No, uh, I wholesale into shops. It's wholesale into shops. Yeah, yeah. We've, got, we've got, when the supermarket trouble got going big time, a lot of my little shops, I'd always sold into little shops. Well, I had, uh, my boast was that I had seven shops in Princess Street in Edinburgh. And uh, the, the Edinburgh people like honey, you know. And, uh, but however, when the supermarkets got going at some, I'd, I guess, 35 years ago, that flattened our business as well, because we had all the little shops that, uh, that were taking the stuff, including Princess Street, closed. <laughs> and we were left with a lot of honey, 35 or 40 tonnes of honey that we couldn't sell. And uh, gradually, I don't know, we had to modify our ways. So uh, I opened a visitor centre to build a, a brand, a st much stronger brand, and opened a visitor centre where people could come in and see and get a lot of information and have a pleasurable couple of hours and let them in for nothing uh, in the hope that they would buy a bit of honey. So that's what's happened. So now we've got the visitor centre and we sell wholesale into um, several hundred shops. I've been told 600. But since Covid that's come down a bit. But some of them are coming online again. But some of the shops take maybe two, two deliveries a year. Others take a delivery every 14 days because there's that many local people eating the honey because they've got it on their breakfast tables. And uh, so that's what it is now. And so we're, we're actually delivering into hundreds of shops. So we've had a bad time lately because uh, when they hear that the, that the honey's coming off the moors, every shop orders and they put orders in for twice as much as they really need uh, because they think that, uh, well, shops seem to get into a hell of a state now in case they run out. and. Uh, so that's come full circle to the supermarket. At one time when I was selling to the shops, I couldn't get the money. And now the shops are desperate to pay because they want the honey and they want my business to survive. So there's been a huge change in our area and it will, that'll have happened all over the country. That'll have happened in Wales and Devon and Surrey and everywhere. Everybody supports the beekeeper. You know about that. You all know about that. If you give somebody a decent jar of honey and charge a reasonable price, not 12 quid or something like that, you'll get the support and they'll be back again for more. You know. To a degree, um, comb honey is perishable. Do you have any problems with the way the, some of the shopkeepers uh, keep it? No, not really, but we do have, we do have problems with it crystallising. You know. And what um, sort of sell, uh, sell by or use by date do you... Oh, we well, never bother. We just put a great long date on it. <laughs> But the, the, we, we don't put any rubbish in the shops, you know. Uh, but the, the thing is, it's, we don't need to put rubbish in the shops because we cut all the, everything that's not so good off, out, you know. And that, that goes into jars. So, so we don't send cut comb with great lumps of pollen in it and that sort of thing, you know. We don't, we don't take, make a fool of the customers. Mm. But the, if, if it crystallises a bit, 
I can get most of the crystals out. You know, obviously if there's rape honey in it, well, we kind of get the crystals out. But you get a very, very mild heat to soften the crystals, you know. But some people w would object to that. But very, I mean, people would be glad to get a nice piece of cut comb in, uh, in July that had been produced the previous July, you know. And they're bloody pleased to get it, you know. Come on holiday and that's what I want, you know. And at the end of the day, if they put it onto a bit of hot toast, it's fine, you know. And they'll know that. People aren't uh, eternally stupid, you know. So if you've got bees over 1,500 square miles, um, how many colonies have you got? Well, about 1,500. We're supposed to have 1,800, but I don't really know. We've never counted up. We have had attempts at counting them. And then that all sort of falls by the wayside, you know. But we've got them over a colossal area. But I'm well aware that I've always got a lot of empty hives about because of the, we've got problems with queenlessness, you know. And um, what do you reckon your winter losses are percentage-wise? Well, in, in, we used to always reckon in 10%, but I would say a lot of the winter losses are running about 25%, you know. Mm, yeah. it's, um, been a, it's been a really difficult time this last 10 years with viruses. Uh. Yeah, I was going to ask how, how that's um, uh, increased with, um, with varroa and viruses. So well, well, we're, we're a bit uh, sort of careless with treating the bees for varroa, and we have been for a long time. And we've had some heavy losses as a result of that. We just to take the losses, you know, and, and, and worrying times for the people. Well, I've been worried about it as well, but I've come through a long time, you know. Uh, I always thought that the black bees would eventually get on their feet, uh, as they did in the 50s with Nozema and Acarine. The black bees really got on their feet. They, they, they threw it off, those diseases. And uh, if you let an up die, eventually they'll come back, you know. But when you've got a lot of people employed, it's d d empty hives isn't, isn't mighty good, you know. But however, uh, of late anyway, the, the lads are looking round and they barely rarely see any varroa uh, in the hives because obviously the bees have started to deal with the varroa themselves over an extended period, 10 to 15 years. And, uh, but then I made inquiries with a, a professor in St Andrews, a virologist, and he said that you can't have any varroa in your hive, you know. But of course, I've got to have varroa in my hives because I've got to have every colony resistant to varroa, you know. It's all very well having 70 or 80 percent of them resistant, but of course, every time they change their queens, you might get back into a lack of resistance, you know. So you've got this, this, this to and fro all the time. And uh, the, the bees taken a very negative attitude to life in general, which we would describe as low morale. And uh, high morale and low morale is very much to do with beekeeping and to do with the beekeeper. You know, the beekeeper can affect morale in a colony. And uh, of course, disease is a shocker, you know. And then you've got the climate. Well, black bees are used to bad climate, you know. That's what the. That's what they're really used to. They're adapted to a bad climate. You know. But disease didn't half knock them for six, you know. And the viruses, and there's all different types of virus in the same, in the same group, you know. So a virus could, could change, you know. So the bees are obviously going to have great difficulty in getting to cope with those viruses if they're always changing. And uh, so really the only way for us uh, in the long term, is to start and make a lot of nuclei to make up for the to, for the expected losses, and uh, and maybe not bother to try and get much rape honey in the spring, and rather than that, try and build up the colonies and make and make nuclei. And if they get a bit of rape, rape honey, well and good. But there are so many fields of of rape that have been bred not to produce nectar. So the plant. The plant scientists have said, well, there's too much nectar being, plant, being produced here and not enough oil. And they're trying to produce oil to put value into the, into, the, into the rape, you know. So what are your methods for making up nuclei? Oh, well, we we'll just take, a, we'll just take a three or four frames out of a strong colony and put them into a, either a, a polythene, polystyrene box or, a, or an empty hive and take them away somewhere else into the next apiary and then uh, put a queen cell in. So that's another 
big step forward we've had in this last few years that uh, Michael um, Collier started to take an interest in our black bees and uh, he, he's sending up some queen cells for us and we're producing a few queen cells ourselves, you know. And otherwise we might find the odd queen cell in a hive and put them in. Or one way or another we'll get a queen cell into a nucleus, you know. Mm. And this year that's been greatly successful. The, the, nuclear, the nuclei were all taken to the heather and they're packed out with heather honey. And some of them even got a super heather honey. So we've had a better we've had a better result this year than we've had for many a year. You know, all morale, the beekeeper's morale has improved. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so so w w being uh, right on the border, presume you've got bees in Scotland as well. Oh yes, a lot of bees in Scotland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, that would bring me to another thing because a slightly different um, uh, situa situation with a disease. Oh, um, I'm not near any of those other jokers, no. <laughs> I'm well away from them. <laughs> we, so never see, we never see European fowl brood or American fowl you know, brood. I've never seen it. So no. you, 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 now, my father said that the, 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 the black bees that we've got would never take European fowl brood. Right. So they would never suffer from it. So you're not credited for it? You, you, would, you would never, I don't know when we ever last heard of any colonies around us that had American fowl brood. There was some in Rothbury last year. And the people involved were making a lot of a lot of fuss and a lot of noise, uh, but at the end of the day, they had bought bees in from somewhere, you know, and uh, and I think the ministry boys were sick of them, you know, because they were devious. They get the AFB and then they're devious, you know. In fact, I had some empty hives on a site, and they went and burnt them, you know, without me telling me or white, you know, and the, the ministry were a bit sick. But they had bought bees in from somewhere, Greece, I think. But you wouldn't know because th these people are devious, you know, and they don't conform to any anything or anybody, you know. But I can put up with that. Uh, so, are you accredited for the Dash scheme or not? No, no, you're not. No. Okay. Um, considering the uh, area your apiaries are in, uh, how much do you reckon your locations vary? Because if you're on 1,500 square miles, there must be quite a bit of uh -huh, variation. that's right. Yeah. Well, well, well. In the summer, in the summer, you'd have to watch where the north wind was, or the northwest wind, which is the prevailing wind, which is the wind that comes from Greenland and down Norway, and across at an angle over North Berwick and and further down the coast and across the country. So, if the bees are anywhere in that in that wind, you're just wasting your time, you know. Do you think altitude makes any difference? Oh, a huge difference, yeah. So, so altitude even at 50 feet and a wind is, is going to make sure that you don't get any honey. You know, That's as simple as that. Mm. So some, our bees are at, 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 in the heather at about 1,000 feet. But, but even then, we're mighty careful where we put them, you know, so that no wind can get at them. I know perfectly well, of course, at that time of year, we're tired and you're shifting bees and you oh, for God's sake, just put them down. Well, that'll never do. You have to, every site has to be chosen. So that the, if the west, northwest wind starts, you know, the problem with the northwest wind is that it, it blows at four o'clock in the morning. And that's when the bees get a right sickener. And of course, the black bees are careful. They're careful bees. And they say to themselves, well, this, this is a bloody awful place and we don't want to be here and the shut up shop for the rest of the season. They, they think that next, the only way that they'll see next spring is to shut up shop totally. So, because there are, but of course you see the northwest wind's not so bad through the day because there's uh, the sun. The sun's, you get a, a solar gain at 10 and 11 o'clock and right through till two and three. And that, that lessens the effect, but the, the, the effect is sort of between 11 and six o'clock in the morning. But you know yourself, if you go out at six o'clock in the morning, even if it's, the weather's good, it's cold, you know. And that's, the bees react to that. The black bees are, are bred to react to the, to the weather conditions that they find themselves in, you know. So if the sights are, I've got them up against walls and all over the, and so there's no wind can get there, you know. And we study it to the nth degree, keeping them out of the wind. So with the variations, do your management techniques uh, vary or...? or oh, or no, you, yeah. no, no, no. No, we just, we, just, no. we just work away on, you know, just... Uh, 
And what, what's, your, what's your basic hive set up? Single brood chamber? Presumably? Smith hives, yeah, single chamber. Single uh, we, we built all the hives ourselves, you know. We, built, we must have built 1,500 hives ourselves in our own workshops, you know, dried the wood. And my father was very friendly with Smith, and Smith was, was my father was a scientist, but he had, the family had bees for a long, long time. And my father learned his beekeeping from the people he was teaching. So he was teaching about 150 people to keep bees in the borders. And he learned from them because some of them were extremely in, intelligent and capable people. They were looking after bees with the greatest of bees. And others were struggling because they, 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 they just struggled and that's it, you know. And the dad could say, well, you're going wrong there and you're going wrong there. But they didn't necessarily take it on board. But then Smith had 120 hives of his own in Peebles, and he was a full-time commercial beekeeper. But he was producing bulk heather honey in Peebles, bell heather and Kaluna and ling. Uh, and uh, so then when my father got with Smith, uh, there was always some very uh, uh, detailed conversations about what would work and what wouldn't work. You know. And then a lot of times I went out round with my father and I listened to what other beekeepers were saying, you know. But there were some tremendous skills in the 50s. <laughs> yeah. Tremendous skills. You feed upon some uh, questions that I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask how Willie Smith made a living with no more than 140 colonies. Uh -huh. What has changed uh, well, in, in, in the time? Yeah, I don't really know, but, but Peebles would be a poor place to keep bees, you know, and it, and, and it is now. But what happened was that he had, uh, he would start with feral colonies, you know, but nobody wants feral colonies, but I'm talking about just after the first war, he was actually at the Battle of the Somme, Willie Smith. But uh, he would somehow select the, the ferals until he got, you know, into some better colonies. And uh, he was a chauffeur, so that the, the man Ballantyne, who had the woolen mill, said to Willie Smith, well, no, I won't need you till four o'clock, or you go and do your bees. And that's how that worked. And he would select and select and select. So then, then at some stage in the, in, a, in the 60s, I used to go there with my father, but he had colonies in, in, in four, four brood chambers. And uh, there were colossal strong colonies, you know. But what it was, was the brood chambers that were put on had been scraped the year before with a Smith cutter scraper, and the heather honey had been scraped from them, and uh, uh, and then he put them on. Well, those co those chambers would have maybe ten or fifteen pound of heather honey in. They would have ten pound of heather honey in them, and that set the bees going big time. Oh, here's a you know, it's not very good outside, but here's ten pound of heather honey, and the bread in them, you know. And then they got into the habit of of going up skyscraper bees hives until they've got to a colossal strength but they were still black bees and they had started out maybe 25 years before as feral colonies so that gives you some idea how skilled he was but there were plenty of beekeepers when i was a child that could take feral colonies and turn them into winners you know but smith was certainly one of them the problem with smith was that uh, the uh, if the bees got to to as strong as they wanted to be uh, by July, which is about, the, if the weather wouldn't play ball in July, they start to build queen cells. And of course, he wouldn't be gonna do any artificial swarms at that time of year. The season was going downhill, it was getting over, you know? So he had to go through these colonies, which had four brood chambers and knock the cells off. And of course, he had no, little or no gear in the way of gloves or anything like that. He had no, no really, you know, just a, a really rudimentary veil, wire veil, and no gloves. And of course, they started to sting him, you know, and that was a bad time, you know, yeah. uh, trying to go through them because he knew that if he knocked the cells off, if the bell heather started to yield, and where that is, there's whole banks of huge banks of bell heather, uh, the bees would just forget straight away about. Mm -hmm. Uh, building queen cells because the bees really wanted to get honey and the bees would say oh here's a lot of honey scrub the whole thing but he had to get through that 14 uh, uh, or 15 or uh, 18 days 
at the start to build Queen Sails, which was a bad time for him, you know, with all those colonies. And of course, the Queen's wings would be clipped, so she wouldn't get away. There wouldn't be any swarms lost. But he was under a colossal amount of pressure to do that, you know. Yeah. So once the ling started to yield, of course, not every year that they got a crop of honey, but he maybe had a couple of deeps, uh, deeps of, of heather, heather honey off, you know. And that was all scri uh, scraped down into a great big uh, press, which was a lathe cut screw, which he designed. Some of you will have seen those, those, those things. Well, like a cider press, but on the side. And scrim, linen bags, and one thing, another. And, and, I, and, I, and I used to do 500 weight a day. I can remember being there. And he said that was his producti productivity, was 500 weight a heather on a day, pressed and that. And then, and then it went straight into the jars with great big bubbles in it. And I know some of the jars wouldn't hold a pound. It wouldn't hold a, there were so many bubbles in the, in the yeah. And, and uh, it was a magnificent sample. And then before he put it into the shops, he dunked it in a bit of hot water, you know. So I don't know why, well, that would be to stop it from fermenting. But it would never be particularly prone to ferment. But the moisture level would be higher than the permitted level, you know, in heather honey. It would be sometimes 21%. But for some reason it didn't ferment, you know, because the books say, well, if it's above 18, it's going to ferment. Well, if it was rape honey, it would. But heather honey, it has to be pretty wet before it ferments. Mm -hmm. For what reason, I cannot say. But it's a unique product, you know. And then he used to build great big, great big pyramids of jars of heather honey in the local grocer's shops. Pyramids in the, in the what they call window dressing. And wonderful, really, eh? Because he had the grocers waiting for the for the, the honey coming in uh, to do the window dressing. You know? So that was that was his, yeah. yeah for, for the benefit of the new um, beekeepers, um, who Willie uh, is talking about is Willie Smith, the designer of the Smith Hive, who was a yeah. Scottish uh, beekeeper. Yeah, he was the he was the first commercial beekeeper in Scotland. Uh, so compared to uh, modern beekeepers, how? Um, how good do you think some of these older beekeepers were? Oh well, they were, wise. They, well they were outstanding. You know, I've come across people that were uh, Andrew Scooby. I wrote a, a bit for him in my book. He's a quite outstanding. You know, uh, clever man. You know, well, black bees and looking after. They weren't buying any bees in. You know, and they weren't relying on queen breeders in Denmark or anything like that. You know, they were, they were relying on their own ability. <laughs> and their understanding of the bees and what the bees were capable of and what they were doing. So there were stock, there were stockmen really, you know, devoted stockmen, you know. But taught the beekeepers changed because so many queens are bought in from queen breeders elsewhere. And there are some very outstanding queen breeders, you know. I mean, we've, we've stuck with black bees, but I'm quite ready to admit there are better bees than black bees. But because the family always had black bees and they've always kept us, I thought we'll just stick with them, you know, and try and make a, something of it, you know. So what do you think the older beekeepers would make of modern beekeepers and uh, how the craft has developed since? Well, at one time, of course, you know, it got, it got to the stage where around us there were hardly any beekeepers. Beekeeping just died away, you know. They didn't want, people didn't want to be bothered with what with the rape and, and uh, and one thing and another in the supermarkets, they're sick of it, you know, because the, the local grocers were supporting the beekeepers at one time, like 100%, you know, everything went through the local grocers. And a lot of people got fed up with it, you know, and then suddenly, well, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, beekeeping suddenly become, uh, become very popular and there's a great deal of interest in bees, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, it's very difficult for people to pick up the skills, you know, because uh, country people were, a lot of country people had great aptitude uh, for, for country skills, you know, and people have mo moved to towns now and they've moved into other occupations and that. And of course that aptitude's been lost, you know, and, and really you'll never ever make that up again. I don't know whenever you could make that up, you know. Because I suppose that most of them were the, that were doing beekeeping would start when they were teenagers, you know. But if you if you try to move into beekeeping when you're 60 years old, it's going to take. You've got to be very, you know, quick about learning, you know. And there are people. I met people at this conference who I know 
are getting on the road to being good beekeepers. You know, treat, you've got to treat the bees with with respect. You know, which is you've got to start that way. Treat always treat them with respect, and leave them alone. And uh, yeah, never well, get into disputes with them. You know, because if they get into <laughs> If they get upset, uh, they remember because they've got a corporate memory. So their, their whole their whole life life is is controlled by instinct and intelligence. And, and in order to have intelligence, they've got to have a corporate memory. They've got to remember what went wrong somewhere else. Mm. So if they've had a fight with a beekeeper, they can remember that very easily. You know. So the next time the beekeeper goes. And the beekeeper is trying to get skills and get get going. They remember, uh, and that's pretty fatal, you know. It's not good. So, are all your apiaries permanent, or are you migratory? Well, migratory. Yeah. They all go to the heather, you know, and back. They're just getting them back again now. But the the well has been that hot they couldn't get the, hardly get the bees back because the bees were down into one chamber, and there were too many hives, too many bees in the hives, you know. So they had to be, you know, you need a cold day to get them home, you know. But they, they get on. It's a huge under, undertaking just getting them home, you know. But the lads are quite happy. They're not. I'm not panicking, and they're not panicking. You know. One question that's been asked is: Do do bees that have remained at static sites for years do better than ones that are continuously well, migrated? Well, they would. They would do if, if the sites were, you know, within an area where there was a continuity of nectar. A place like that over there, you know. I mean, lime trees and sycamore trees and, you know, and then, of course, it would depend on the number of colonies that are in the site, you know. If there were four or five, they're going to do extremely well, you know. And if they're 14 or 15, well, you know, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be times when there's going to be a bit of malnutrition. And uh, so matching the number of bees to the permanent site is, is critical, you know, but you just have to look around. and. Of course, if there are a lot of houses, there's a lot of gardens, you know, some of the, I see in London even here, there's an awful lot of huge gardens, you know, in the back of houses, huge areas, places that would support a fox or two, never mind bees, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know the reason for why the question was asked, but I guess it might have been uh, that some uh, areas might be earlier uh, uh -huh. and others later. That might, might be the reason the question not was well, asked. Well, that's right, but that's, that's just where you are, you know. If you were on a hillside in County Durham, you're not going to get any honey until until July, you know. Mm. But if you're down south here, and, and you're going to start and get a bit of honey in, mm. in so, May. Well, uh, so how do you deal with efficiency, Willie? Um, how do you, somebody's asked, how do you maximise honey production whilst minimising work and cost inputs? Well, we have to be at that all the time, you know. I mean, the discussions just now that uh, we've got a vast amount of cut comb, and, and my daughter and she'll get help shortly, but they're cutting it out and it's, they're, having, they're having a great deal of difficulty matching the weights to the required weights, you know. So we're going to have to put, when I was a kid, the comb honey was all uh, produced with dividers. Sections, yeah. Dividers, so we're not going to need to introduce dividers so that when my daughter cuts the honey up, it's all the same weight. And uh, otherwise, we're putting, she's putting honey out at, I think it's 212 grams, and some of it will be 230 and 240 grams. She's losing a packet, you know, on the on the on the money side. But in the other way, the other way of looking at it is I'm selling enough on the internet and enough in my place at the retail price to 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 help with that, you know. And but that's obviously a massive loss in terms of revenue, trying to sort the cut comb into you know. The frames are in a different, or they've got a wobble in them, or something like that. So we're going to have to do rapidly get ourselves into into dividers between the manly frames, so that everything comes out the same weight. Otherwise, people are getting a lot more cool money sometimes than the than they paid for. You can't sell it by weight, then. No, no, everything goes out at two twelve. She was trying it at two two twenty seven, but that was mm. she was losing a lot of money at two twenty seven. But two twelve would be all right, you know. Mm. So on to the That's uh, a shallow frame. That's seven pieces of honey out of a out of a shallow frame. Mm. So it's like fourteen hundred uh, isn't it? That's seven twos is 
1,400 and 712, 1,484 grams out of a shallow frame. Yeah. Uh, so on there to your ins inspection um, uh, regimes, um, what, what, what is that? What, what, what do you reckon to work on? Well, when we started, we were on nine-day inspection, you know. Yeah. But the bees, our life, well, my life was ruined. Dad's life was ruined as well, you know, because we were going away to look at hives at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon because uh, the rain had stopped. Dad says, it stopped raining. We'll have to go 20 miles away and look through these hives. Well, the bees, had been raining. The bees didn't want to see it. Of course, they were... They were, they were getting nasty with that, you know, we were ruining the bees, going through them, trying to, the, we, clipped, we clipped the queens, and uh, I went through the hives and Dad, we clipped the queens, but we never marked them. Uh, Dad said that he, he considered it an insult to mark a queen bee. Uh, he had so much respect for them, uh, he wouldn't mark them, so we had to find them if we needed to find them. And we were making artificial swarms, which I've described in my book. And uh, we did that up until about we were 600 hives. And then after that, we were tipping them on the back. We were going round at, at, um, at somewhere near the appointed time and uh, tipping them on the back and looking up underneath to see if there was any queen cells or see what we could see, you know. If we saw jelly, we did something about it. And generally at that time, we packed up with artificial swarms and we just made a nucleus on the old site and took the main hive away, out the road. And we never went back, you know. Generally, the nucleus was all right. We didn't have all this virus and barua trouble then. Beekeeping was pretty straightforward. There was never any bother with the bees, you know. And then, well, that was it, you know. I can't think, really. Once we, once we well, what happened was that, that uh, once the rape got going in a big way, we had struggled. We couldn't do any inspections till the rape was finished because the frames were, you couldn't touch the frames because of honey rain, railing out, raining out. You couldn't touch anything because you touched, there was hot, like nectar pouring out of the frames and drowning the bees and that. So till the rape was finished, we uh, were just concentrating and putting on supers. And then we started doing inspections, which is what we do now. And, uh, but we're more interested now in just making nuclei. And for some reason or other, over the years, we had bothered with feral colonies and they were, making, they were building queen cells all the time. And then Dad says, we won't kill the feral queens, we'll just let it drift. And gradually, all the bees, all our bees have got themselves, they've got rid of the feral, feral attitudes, you know, and got themselves into decent black bees, you know. They got rid of the feral problem. They got rid of the stinging and got rid of the queen cell building. So we're not much bothered with queen cells. I would be, like it better if there were more queen cells being built. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the, uh, the book. In fact, there are two of them, Reflections on Beekeeping yeah. and also Willie Robson, His Words. Yeah, well, I, I, that, the first bee book, I was a bit sort of gung-ho, you know. But the second book, I've gone to town because I've, writ <laughs> I've, I've written all about the last the troubles in the last 20 years, because I've lived with it, and I've written how the honey farm uh, was started right from day one. It's been going 75 years now. And uh, I made a better job of it. You know. you were. A, be a better job, yeah. You always do that, don't you? You think the second time around I could make a better job, you know. So um, that, it's all been written in a hurry because I was written it, writing it through... Uh, yeah. yeah. On, on the train down here, yeah. Well, uh, writing it, you know, <laughs> bit by bit when I was tired of one thing or another. Yeah. Um, with your hive inspections, how do you work? Do you work singly or in teams? Oh, well, some of them go themselves, but that much is not much use, you know. You better go in twos. You know. The trouble is that, that um, it's, if you go with a vehicle um, and two, two people, it's going to cost you more than £30 an hour. Mm. And the vehicles to pay for after that, you know. So it's going to cost you £300 a day. Yeah. You know? So one person who you give an exceptional wage to can often do as much work as two. And, and that's what I'm doing just now. But gradually, 
Gradually we'll go on to twos, you know, because it's... Yeah, they need to be on twos, but it's going to cost you 300 and 350 pounds a day, which, which is a huge outlay. But we, the business is able to pay wages now because we've got cosmetics and stuff like that. And, and book sales? I don't think we'll make much of the book sales. <laughs> <laughs> so I may. Uh, so are you all staff permanent or, or seasonal? Yes, we've got all long term. Nobody gets paid off. Even through COVID, nobody lost their job. And how many colonies do you reckon are handled in an hour? Oh, I have no idea. We don't work like that, you know. We, we go through bees with respect. I'm not an industrial beekeeper, you know, I don't kick them. Industrial beekeepers work like that because I was brought up exactly not to do that, you know, to take your time, always take your time. So I can actually work through a colony of black bees without a veil, you know, quite easily. Mm. You know. But there were beekeepers when I was a child that could do that, you know. Mm. And I think often the, 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 the bees were purebred, you know purebred black bees which would tolerate people you know and I think of course in this in the in the 50s there's an awful lot of Italian bees and once they got outcrossed there's nobody could handle the bees because the, the resultant outcrosses were were aggressive if too aggression yeah. Ad aggressive so I don't honestly know but but I, with us looking after the bees in a sensible manner and never getting on the wrong side of them they become you know but we've had ours DNA, DNA tested, and they've said that they're between 90 and 94 percent pure, pure black bees. Well, that's actually amazing because a lot of parts of the country won't get that. And if you've no. got 1,500 colonies, yeah. uh, you're going to get integration from something else. Well, all the time, yeah. yeah. So, so, but they're free mated. But Michael Collier says that the, for years they've been mated at the heather uh, at a, a very low temperature, 14 degrees maybe. Yeah. 12, 13, 14 degrees where the, the people say, well, it's 18. It should be mated at 18 degrees. And our lot are getting, so all the incomers are getting, uh, are getting, um, are getting knocked out because they won't get mated at the, at the lower temperatures. And also, and also the, the, the bulk of the bees are black and they're all much the same. They're all inbred to a fair degree in that. And they're, they're the dominant, the dominant bees, they're dominant in the whole setup. So in actual fact, we've look, heard in lectures there this, in this session that the bees can change their genes yeah. very quickly, you know. So the, the other ones want to become black bees, you know. So they'll become darker and the, the, the other ones, the interlopers, will assume the same characteristics as the black bees, as the dominant ones. Yeah. Whereas in the rest of the country, the black bees aren't dominant, you know. The other bees are dominant. So the black bees are never, ever going to get going. And of course, the, the, they can't cope with the t climate, the black bees, down here. It's far too hot for them. And uh, they're never going to be much of a success. And I mean, feral bees are no use at all, really, you know, except, as I've written, the feral bees were able to withstand Barua. And they knew that in Europe, that the feral black bees would, would be resistant to Barua. So you can fairly say that sometime in the last whatever million years, there's been mites in hives before that they've got, they've got resistant to, you know. But then there aren't many real feral bees about, you know. But they are there and they're resistant. You mentioned you can handle bees with, um, with just a, a, a veil off. Yeah. Um, do you tolerate bad tempered bees at all? Well, we'll just leave them because we know, see, you might, well, there's a bad tempered one there and if that's mentioned, well, just leave them, we'll never go in. But you would know in a year or two's time that would leave because they would change their queen. <laughs> They'd have another queen and the bad tempers lost them because the, the main bulk of the bees, the, the dominant ones, are all good tempered. So yeah. eventually the other ones fall into line because they changed their queen. Yeah. <laughs> Now you mentioned queen problems and uh, you know you and I have been discussing oh. this for, for a long time. I first really discovered it around about the turn of the century. Oh. Um, you, 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 you tell us what, um, what your view is and well, what, I, I, I can your, your experiences. I can only, you know, I know that 
that, that when we were, you know, going well, that the bees quite often lasted four years. Uh, the queens. Queens, yeah. Uh, maybe four years was quite normal. And, that. and you could get a crop of honey off a four-year-old queen. But uh, no, they're not lasting any length of time at all, which means the reproduction's broken down. And in any animal, when reproduction breaks down, it's really, it's really the end of the road. It's, it's, it's uh, you know... It's not a lot that, that can be done after reproduction's broken down, you know. Uh, so that's a serious, really serious business, you know. So we're told that after, with the Varroa, after Varroa, the viruses got going, they mutate the viruses. And this year it's not been so bad, but the only way I can see around it is physically to make more nuclei. So, and you'd have to keep the nuclei in a different location because these, these diseases are all transmissible. They go from hive to hive. Uh, you, would, might, you might get 10 hives and seven of them have got, have got problems with queenlessness. And so it's going along the road. So it, it's gonna pay all of you to have bees in another place uh, as, a, as a backup, you know? I came out on somebody the other day, a woman, that she bought a lot of honey off us, but she says they had to keep in bees for, without a lot of trouble for a while but all five hives are empty, you know? So I, I said, well, oh, well, the wasps, were, but I said, it's not the wasps, it's the fact that the, all the queens have failed. You know? And I got, I don't know how their people ever get going again. You know? Well, they buy in, they buy in honey from, uh, bees from God knows where, you know? And that presents a lot more problems, you know? Very often, although, I mean, I mean some of the queens, the buckfast queens, they're fine, carniolans, Got some very good quality queens from Denmark and Germany and that. And they've kept beekeeping going, really, the imports. I mean, in Ireland, they play hell about the imports. Well, probably they're right, you know, because the Irish beekeepers always had plenty good black bees. You know. But uh, the imports have kept beekeeping going, you know. Uh, I've got one question here from somebody. Do you do the things that small-scale beekeepers are often told to do, such as regular comb chains, shooks form, disinfecting equipment between hives? Well, we don't do shaken swarms, and we don't disinfect equipment. You know. But we do make an attempt to change the frames. You know. That's a, always a good idea. Always a good idea. And um, what do you think of the uh, sort of modern fashion of placing a super underneath the brood boxes well, for winter? Well, I, I don't understand that. That's not going to work, is it? No. I'm asking the question. <laughs> well, it's not going to. It's not going to work. No, because the, the bees, the bees work from the bottom up. You know, they follow temperature and moisture. The bees do. So any hive that is wide, wide, has no use. It's got to be vertical. So you'd always put the next super on top, or else you would get a, you could get a, a situation which we used to call chimneying, yep. uh, and you get you would get that in Northumberland because the bees say, well, there's a lot of room above us, and we want to stay away from the outside of the hive, <laughs> so they, they would give themselves three inches on the outside of the hive and come up the middle and make a chimney. But putting supers underneath is, well, if you thought that the bees could do with some ventilation near the brood nest, that would probably work, you know. Mm. It's not the end of the world, is it? It's just... Mm. Uh, you've written a couple of books, uh, Willie. Uh, do you actually have time to read books and magazines and scientific oh, material? Yeah, well, I, I read the Bee Farmers magazine, you know, and try and pick out the, pick out the bits that are, like, worth noting. Because we have to, because... Uh, I mean, we're in trouble, you know. So if you're in trouble, you've got to try and get some, you know, some information. But it's only the bee farmers, really, magazine. Because uh, uh, most of the other magazines are written by, pe by people that are struggling, you know, just like us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Willie. Um, we've, we've come to the end. And thank yeah. you very much for being uh, very open and answering the questions. Uh -huh. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.